Gather around the lava lamp, folks. It's time for my second long chat. And my guest uh, on this episode of my new series is Chris Cipollini, author, writer, poet, all around creative soul and art lover. So I thought it would make for an interesting chat. Here we go. Without further ado, enjoy. Okay, so we are ready to go. Hello. Chris, how are you? I am well, Matt. How are you today? <laughs> I'm very good, yeah. It's 8 a.m. where you are right now, isn't it? Um, Let me see. Uh, let me check. It is, yeah, it's 8.02 on the nose. That's early. Thank you for doing this call. Oh, dude, I'm up at 5. 30 just normally like with no alarm so this is this is midday for me <laughs> really are you an early riser i'm an early riser i just can't help it i'm just kind of wired that way my grandfather would wake up at like four o'clock every day i thought he was nuts and i think i've just inherited it so what time do you go to sleep at night 10 10 30 10 i can operate off six hours of sleep yeah that's not bad you know i always for a while you know i did that for a while and i just you know I it, I felt good. I felt better. My whole body, my brain felt better. I mean, it just worked for me, but somehow yeah. I feel like I just have that self-destructive thing in me that eventually <laughs> just leads me to just like completely, you know, go back to the old ways. No, man, it's fine. You know, well, it's all those Pasolini movies. You got to lay off those. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking as well. I was watching a three hour long Chinese film today and I was like, this is an okay. act of self-destruction. How so? I feel like art is a little bit of a process of art destruction. Uh, I mean, self-destruction. And um, I feel that, you know, whether you experience it or you make it, you're somehow committing an, an act of destruction on yourself, for good or for bad, because we don't know what's going to happen next. But how do you feel about that? I completely agree. Um, I absolutely completely agree. As someone who has, I mean, my my way of creating has never really been, I mean, you've talked to people like Marina Abramovic and stuff. So, I mean, thank you for even talking to me about this, but, um, it's, I, I don't really consider it. I don't know. It's like, it's a dangerous dance because on the one hand you can really leap into a void and expose some things that are tragic and painful and they take you to places you're not ready to go to in your day to day mind, but you can take that horror and hideousness and you can morph it into something transcendent and beautiful that really depends on you. So there's a pressure, you know, to really make something worthy or you just look mad, if that makes any sense. Hmm. Do you feel like much of a di I know this may seem like a silly question, but I have been thinking about this a lot. Uh, what is the crucial difference between making art and experiencing art, especially when like you um, you when you experience art, the intention, at least that's the way I perceive art, is to make that work, whatever it is, whether it be a book or a painting or something like that, mm -hmm. to make it your own. You know, given that, what is what do you feel is the, the difference in making something and creating something? I mean, can you create even? It's a complex question, but... <laughs> No, I, 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 I get upset that I don't get asked these kind of questions enough, you know. Um, truthfully, the, I think really the, the difference, the, the finite difference is just, it depends on the person. I don't think there's one solid answer. I really, really don't. It's a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, I know that if I start writing and I get really into it and I start writing, writing a prose piece or writing about a certain author or a certain actor who I admire – and I just have a whole canon of their work in front of me that I'm very passionate about, or I'm writing a prose piece and it's tapping into that, you know, that Marianas, that mental Marianas trench that can just go on forever and just go and go and go. It's, it, well, first of all, it drains you. I'll tell you that right now. I have walked away from writing something where my hand is like dead, it's throbbing and I'm hungry and I'm just it's like honestly it's like going to the gym mentally if that makes sense you're just wiped out but at the same time it's overshadowed by this complete sense of euphoria that oh my gosh i've accomplished something so great today 
And regardless of the fact if anyone will see it or access it, that's irrelevant. What matters is you have manifested it. It um, it's kind of like, do you remember that? Um, there's this 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 one. Uh, I don't know if it was. Um, there's this one painting of this um, gentleman. He's um, he's sleeping, and there's a devil at the end of his bed playing the violin. Have you seen that? Uh, it rings a bell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I, I'm asking that because it's it's inspired by this uh, one musician. I don't think it was Paganini, but he says something like he had a vision and he, that the devil was in front of his bed in his sleep, and it played a trill that was so deep and so euphoric. It was just such a transcendent, deep sound, and right away he wanted to interpret it. But it, you know, it, and it's gone on as one of like the devil's snot, I believe it's called, and it's gone on to become one of these magnificent works of you know music but at the same time he said when he did it it couldn't even scratch the surface what he really heard it was just nothing and that's to me kind of what it's like to be inspired or create it's just yeah you can interpret within your abilities but there's something richer deeper and much bigger that we're constantly striving for be you a writer poet painter filmmaker whatever Hmm. Still thinking of that painting. Could it be The Nightmare by Henry Fuseli? Well, you know what? I See, I'm better with visuals than I am with names, sadly. Um, I don't know. I Just put, um, if you go to Google Image and just put Devil Violin, you'll probably get a lot of pictures of oh. this really bad movie about Paganini they made a few years ago. But um, <laughs> there's a violin. Awful, dude. Right. Saw... There's a violin involved. So maybe that's not the one. It's there's not a violin. The... Mm. It's not the painting that yeah. I'm talking about, yeah. It could be. It's pro your painting is probably much cooler, but um, <laughs> it's an engraving more like. But yeah, it's funny because um, you're mentioning that Chinese movie. Sorry to go off topic. I was actually watching Casino last night. You ever see that movie? Oh, yeah. I love it. Okay. Um, fun fact. My mom is actually in that movie. No. Where? <laughs> okay. What at part? the very end of the movie... Yeah, at the very end of the movie, when Artie Piscano is having a heart attack and everything's going down, and they're playing that song um, "House of the Rising Sun." Yeah. Um, he, the woman runs up to him and said, "Artie, Artie, my husband." That's my mom. I remember she got that part. It says so in the credits. Carrie Cipollini. Wow. So I'm proud of that. <laughs> yeah. That's something. It parts run in the family. Mm. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. something. I was yeah. uh, listening uh, very closely to what you were saying earlier, and uh, uh, you know, because we're talking of the devil, somehow sneaked itself into our what we were talking about. Because the devil is in the detail, that's what they say. But you did say something that uh, that fascinated me, and uh, you said that something about uh, you know it hurts your hand to write so much, and uh, so that that implies that you hand write, you hand write, you you write stuff by hand. With the pen? I write by hand. No. Yeah, I, I always start by hand, and then I try to transcribe onto it. Honestly, I associate a laptop with just work. Yeah. I mean, laptops <laughs> are fun and all that, but when I get on my computer, it's a, it's a new thing. It's a modern thing, and I, there's very little romance involved in it to me. I, used to, I, I, mean, I just use mine to watch movies and essentially play music, but to me, writing is a hand activity always. I'm very tactile. How does it yeah. make you feel that you're somewhat of a minority now in that sense? I don't care. Right. Well, no, well, I mean, <laughs> I I'm, just it's a, interestingly, I'm a purist. interestingly, you know, you, uh, I realized uh, that you are off a lot of social media and uh, you're trying to pro probably limit your time, the time that you spend on it. Uh, th why did, why is that? I, you know, I, well, I mean, I, I don't like Twitter. Um, just because I, I was really just using my Twitter to troll Trump, to be honest with you. And because um, who doesn't? Because I'm a good American. But also, um, I don't know. I just, I, when you're a writer, being allowed to only put 140 some odd characters is, is kind of torture. You can't because I'm long winded. So Twitter never had any catch to me at all. I never was attracted to it. Um, Instagram, I like quite a bit. And Facebook, it just gets really vacuous. This is the third time I've dropped it, and I will tell you it's the final time. I'm no longer interested in going to Facebook. Um, I'm sure it's good for networking purposes. I get that. But to me, it just became very consumptive, and I just – I don't know. I'm just not into it anymore. Yeah, Instagram is nice, though. Mm, well, you know, 
the interesting thing is that uh, we sort of met on social media uh, a and, long yeah. time ago, and it was uh, a very unusual way. Yeah, let's way. not talk about those days. Those were weird. No, <laughs> we'll, were... we'll disregard the silent film thing. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> Backstory, folks. We'll talk another day. Are but... <laughs> you serious? That's, that's fascinating. Yes. We met. Well, because... you know, I don't know. You don't Heart know? Hard on my sleeve. <laughs> well, you're not watching silent films anymore? Um, you know, I don't really watch as many of them as I used to, but let me tell you, when I used to live in Seattle, there was a place there that was great. You would have loved it. You can probably find better ones out where you are, but um, there was a place that was called the Harvard Exit Theater, and I was um, – it, it was all the way down up in the hills, and it was like this cool kind of like uh, – it looked like a house that Mary Pickford would have lived in. It was this old kind of, you know, you expect Miss Havisham to just come busting out of this place. And there was all, this, it was a silent film theater in the 1920s. And I walk up there and boom, there's a picture of the Sheik. Boom, there's Teta Barra and there's posters. And I saw that incredibly long film. Um, I forgot who was in it, but that film, A Royal Affair. Do you remember that movie? No, actually, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. Uh, that one Danish actors in it. He's in a lot of stuff. Um, but yeah, I saw it. it was four hours long. I went and I was like, oh, this is going to be wonderful. I like period pieces. And then two hours later, I'm like, God, this is just still going. And you know, it, just, it didn't catch me. It was a good film, but it just didn't catch me, you know. But in any event, I, I went off topic. All I'm saying is, yeah, I like silence, but you know, ebb and flow. Maybe they'll come back. I don't know. Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, for me, it, it's, it, it almost sounds weird to say, but uh, I went through a time recently that it just ended recently where I just wasn't, didn't feel like watching any movies at all. Zero. You? Yeah. You're, you're mad. How is that possible? But the, the thing <laughs> is that, you know, I realized that, um, you know, I was never really just into films. I was always into the arts in general. Somehow I felt like yeah. in life... And this is because people were telling me you can only have one interest. Well, you can have lots of interests like hobbies, but you can't really pursue them all at the same time. And I feel like once I started meeting people who were doing that and who were OK, I realized that it wasn't just a, it, it didn't have to be about one thing anymore. It could be about lots of other things. I mean, I read, I listen to so much music, but for a while I was yeah. all about movies and that was never really me. Publicly, it was, but <laughs> I, yeah, I have I've, a lot of Yeah, I've seen your work on Fred. It's quite good. I have a lot of interests, you know, but you also don't just write. You're also acting, and you're also, you know, you, I remember, you know, the videos that I watched of your poetry readings as well. You Thanks. deal with a lot of art and a lot of different types of art. Mm-hmm. And I mean, yeah, I mean, it's fun. Mm. You know, it's fun to do it. And oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, is that also because you need to you need you just need to have that contact with all of these different art forms that uh, some people may perceive as very different. But actually, to me, it's just part of our existence. <laughs> Well, I, I, I believe, honestly, because art is such a I mean, to say you're an artist is like saying um it's like saying you like music. Well, what type of music do you like? Well, what genre do you like? It's, you know, I mean, it's a, it's, it's such a broad church art. It really, really is. And I don't know. Um, poetry readings were fantastic and I enjoyed them quite a bit. God, it's been centuries since I did one, but, um, I got frustrated with, uh, with, you know, cause I, the lack of physicality and, you know, poetry readings, cause I just had so much energy and the scene got very, um, I don't know, a lot of people got very uh, uptight and uh, very, well, suffice to say, very politically correct. And I just, I don't feel free in that environment. So I kind of, you know, vamoosed. And I looked, sought out local acting scenes. And, you know, I went and I did it. And it was fun. And um, I talked to a lot of friends, actually, who said, well, you know, why didn't you, um, why did you try it? You know, acting is so much more regimented than doing uh than doing poetry. I mean, those are your words. And I said, well, true, but I feel a lot of freedom inside those rules. You know, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a constraint to being too free. In my opinion, I think when you become so free and you don't really know what you're doing, it's confining. 
But when you are out and you have these rules, you have this dialogue and you have these marks to remember and these lines to hit and this person to turn to, it's, and you can master that, it's freeing because you've, you've honed to discipline and you've, you know, strengthened yourself. Yeah, I was thinking recently of um, George Gershwin, right? And uh, the thing that fascinates Rhapsody me about Blue. him. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. it. It's fantastic. Oh, me too. I like to play it on my phone whenever I walk through a city. Yeah. I just like to play it as I walk around. Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> and, you know, especially in the U.S., you know? I mean, it must be. That's why it was. I mean, it's a soundtrack to a certain specific geographic development of everything that was happening at the time. It's It's amazing. Correct. But what I was saying is that George Gershwin was someone who was so creative throughout his life um, in the sense that he just worked and worked. I, I mean, we're just reading what he did. He worked in Rhapsody in Blue. He wrote he wrote while he was on a train ride to um, to uh, the premiere of a musical that he had written because and he'd even forgotten about that assignment that he'd gotten from Paul Whiteman. Right. So it was like it was something mm -hmm. that was at the back of his mind. It's like I have a limited amount of time to do this. And he came up with Rhapsody in Blue on that train ride. Most of it, anyways, then he probably perfected it. But what was interesting to me, well, I mean, what's tragic about him is that I feel like this constant work and this constant motion, this constant energy that he was putting into anything and the intensity of his life eventually led to his death on the moment when he had the first burnout of his life, I feel like. Really? He never was aware of his body so much as when he died very young, on the moment that he probably realized that he couldn't, that was it. He he was doing. T he had done too much. He was too busy. Burnout, dead. Yeah. As tragic as it sounds, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a, the art. The history of arts is full of people like that, and and somehow they're people that I admire. <laughs> but it, that's the thing, and that's why I think that's why we kept in contact so long. Backstory here, folks. We've known each other for a while. Um, I think that the reason because we have kind of like this mutual appreciation for you know i don't i don't know yeah i mean i love artists that still that are still going around now be they musicians or certain writers and stuff i mean i as corny as this is i like some of neil gaiman's work um you know but um or people like patty smith you know god help her lover to pieces but certain people who die at a young age kurt cobain so on or rimbaud or all that there's a certain attraction to that. I would never want to do it in my own life. You know, I want to rot away and be old. I got, I got shit to do, Matt. I don't know about you, but, um, um, in any case, yeah. Um, when you say that, yeah, he, he neglected his own self in order to create art. That's really interesting because to put yourself on the forefront so much as to manifest something that in you is so deep and just needs to be, like I heard this one poem once from this uh, one poet who I admire, who I haven't seen in a long time. And she had a verse in there that said, um, um, write not because you want to, but because you must. And I was like, yeah, exactly. That's what you have to do. There's no two ways about it. You've got to write. And if you don't, you get into this fallow period and it's really hard to get out of. And that can also be said for filmmakers or for, you know, musicians, any kind of creative medium, you got to do it because that's your calling, that's your truth. And I think about um, Henri de Balzac, the, the writer, and he, he, he treated his body like shit. He was not good with himself at all. But he would get up every single day, 4 a.m. He would kill like 20 cups of coffee a day. I'm surprised he didn't like end up in the hospital. And he was just, he just go, just one verse after another, the man wrote, so much work. I did a story about him actually for this magazine I write for. And I was really impressed by that. And I don't know, wh where do you think? Let me ask you. I mean, do you think there's a way you can toe the line of interpreting this muse, but at the same time, not destroy your vehicle, your body at the, you know, in the process? Well, as we're, we're, as we're doing this interview, which, you know, I feel like an interview is a documented thing of a meeting that, you know, can be considered artistic because it's just especially when it's spontaneous and not uh, driven by interest, like, you know, the one we're doing now. Uh, I okay. feel like, you know, this one in particular, we were, we were both supposed to be at the gym or exercising, but we decided to instead do the call. 
<laughs> right? So? Um, uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're exercising our intellects, damn it. And that's so much more important. <laughs> but, you know. Hey, it, just it, eat healthy. Take your vitamins. You'll be fine, folks. Don't worry. Don't let, don't let them mess you up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. How many cups of coffee have you had today? I actually had two, and that's about it for me. I'm 34 years old. I don't go crazy on coffee anymore. Yeah, I have about I, I was actually I, – I, I must admit, I did do a little mini workout, and I found out I couldn't stretch in the way I did when I was like 24, and I was like, oh, God, it begins. But, um, I tell you, now, so, I, now right. I have this guilt. When I don't go to the gym for a couple of days, I'm like, you know, I'm, I just feel terrible about myself. Well, you know what? That's I guess that's good, but I don't like when my body guilts me into doing something. I want to be called to do something. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, you could just do what Rimbaud did and live off of bread, coffee, and sin. Oh, that could man. be your uh, that could be a good way to maintain yourself. Oh my God! Talk I about, love Arthur Rimbaud. <laughs> talk about someone who decided <laughs> he had to be a poet. He just gave up. He was like, "I'm a poet. I'm going to be a poet. I just have to be a poet." At the age of sixteen yeah. or something. And yeah, yeah, that's Rimbaud. Oh, what a fascinating yeah. I feel like he's responsible oh, yeah. for a lot of people, you know, for what he, what he did, you know, and what we know about him. <laughs> yeah, but honestly, that, and that's really funny you say that because I think a lot of the people who admire Rimbaud, you know, like, you know, I think Jim Morrison was aimed to him too. You know, Patty Smith doesn't stop talking about him, but he, I think in a weird way, he'd be like, you like me? <laughs> like, I don't even think he would care. He'd be like, okay, look at these idiots, you know? <laughs> so, like, he was very snarky, but I like him for that, you know? I don't know. But he's he was one of our greats, and he, um... No, in a yeah, way, in a way kind of, in a way, you're, uh, you're going away from social media is a little like that, though. But, but isn't that, I don't know, it's kind of telling that, like, the fact that I step away from one, sh two, I don't know, I don't... I look at TikTok and I'm like, yeah, I'm not touching that with the ten foot pole. But um, I don't even know what that I, is. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 okay, at the risk of sounding like Methuselah, it's something the 21 year olds are into. It's it's more vapid than Snapchat. Yeah. But um, in any event, no, I just I don't think that's it though. I mean, I I'm not going anywhere. Just I I'm just not attracted to it. You know? Are you? Uh, you said earlier that you. You feel like you must, you know, when you when you make art, you feel like don't. What was that line? Don't write poetry because you want to write poetry because you must. Correct. Yeah. Do you um, feel like you have to? I mean, be, or, you know, because you because you must you write because you must. Well, I, I, I do feel I have to. Yeah, honestly, the pull to create is stronger than the pull to like work one's body or, um, you know, eat sometimes as pretentious as that may sound i agree i know I, what you're talking about i know what you're talking about yeah. absolutely i haven't had lunch in years and as, yeah. you haven't had lunch forget about it <laughs> there's a book uh, i saw the other day that has a cool title it has nothing to do with anything this conversation it's called you'll never eat lunch in this town again and i'm like no <laughs> i love lunch but um I already as love i'm it. sitting here talking to you I'm looking at a copy of Edward Monk's The Scream that I have in my apartment, and I'm like, talk about a broken life, man. You know, so, yeah, it's it, like literally it's all around us, the people we're influenced by. You know, that's why, like a lot of my friends have said, oh, you're so reverent of all these people who are dead. I'm like, yeah, because they're awesome. <laughs> Where's our people? You know, <laughs> it's like, it's frustrating. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I want to ask. I lost track of what you were saying. I want to ask you. Well, just on what you said there, are you writing anything at the moment? Um, I go in and out. To be honest with you, I just got this job. It's pretty consumptive. But other than that, um, I have this publication I write for called the French Quarter. Um, I will send you a link. And it's. Uh, I just did an interview with this. Um, uh, this very, very inspiring woman named Diane Pernay. You can find her all over the place. And um, as far as books go, um, I, I wrote my last book I wrote about, uh, it's two years old now, actually. It's called Trifecta, and it's about, um, it's just kind of about the creative process and its prose intertwined with kind of memoir stuff, you know, and uh, I'm proud of that. That's the book I enjoy doing the most. Uh, does it does it involve but like at the moment. memories about your travels and all the traveling that you did when you were in Europe? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, that's a huge part of it. Hmm. And I got I'm Jones to go back pretty soon. <laughs> right. But um, 
No, dude, seriously. I I saw um, Martin, uh, was it uh, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula the other night, and I was like, I need to go to Romania now. I was, <laughs> I was just in Romania. I was in the place where vampires were... Um... You know what? What do you say? It's so grave? corny. I know, but <laughs> yeah. no, it's not corny. You know, it's uh, a. Yeah. I mean, you know, I haven't had a house for. Uh, I haven't rented an, an apartment for longer than a couple of weeks in a long time. And right. that's that's what that's why I'm saying that you know art is self-destructive, whether you make it or you experience it. So travel, I feel like if I, I'm I you know I'm I'm putting together a thought on the creative life myself. So that's why I'm interested in that book. But travel is very much a part of it in my vision of the creative life. And um, yeah. the fact that you use uh, memories from your travels in that book, <laughs> you know, kind of implies or, is, or says to me that uh, you also think so. Uh, well, I mean, not consciously, but now that you mention it, yeah, I do. Um, and it, it's, the travel thing is really kind of a springboard. I was staying in this little... Um, I was staying in this little, uh, um, it, it was kind of cool. It was a trip within a trip. I, I went to Paris. I was there for a couple of weeks. Then I was in uh, this small village in uh, Germany, like blink and you miss it. And it was beautiful and romantic. And I looked outside and there were like geese in a lake. And I heard like church bells. I looked outside, there's nuns. And I'm just like, oh, come on, come on. This is, this is magnificent. I love this. And um, in any case, um, yeah, so I just started writing right then and there, and that kind of just something cracked inside of me, and I just couldn't stop, and I brought that back with me. And um, then I started uh, getting more involved in the local poetry scene. One thing just led to another, kind of like a dance, you know, one step leads to another, and that's why it's called Trifecta, because it's, you know, it's about um, life stories, memoir, and also there's poems and prose infused into it. So it's it's not just one thing. Mm. I've yet to manifest the strength to just stick to one one thing in a book. I, well, I, I'm not there yet. Well, you're in good company because, like, you know, the best of uh, writers weren't able to stick to, you know, to just the one uh, the one structure, I suppose, of, or format, you know. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. If I think of, like, uh, novels but also films, there's so many – uh, yeah, especially in film I, in the 60s, seeing as we brought up French art, you know, I always go back to that because <laughs> there's just so much playing around with different styles that linear storytelling or linear ways of telling story to, uh, stories just kind of went out the window for yeah. one reason or another. And it ended up just being such a revolutionary time in in art in general and just creative creations in general. Well, and that's the thing. I, it's so funny that you mentioned that because I, I, um, I have a book, like two books right now on my coffee table. One about Rothko, one to lose the trek. And I'm like, oh man, it's like, did he know I had these books on my table? You have a camera in my apartment, <laughs> seriously. But <laughs> I can't help it. The French are awesome, and I've always had just such respect and so much love for their craft and their art and their culture, and you know, and they. When I went out there, everybody, you know, was like, oh, they're not going to be kind to you. I have never been received so graciously by people. And they were just, they were magnificent. I, 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 have, I have a lot of love for the French and especially for their art. I had about an hour to be in the Louvre, which was, I mean, it was a beautiful nightmare because it was only an hour because I can't plan. And I did it. And I just ran through there. And it was like, what's that scene in that film? Yeah, you know, yeah, the one yeah. where they're all running through the loop? I think yes. it's... Yes, okay. I've... It's a Band Apart. Uh, Band Apart. Yes, uh, yes. Band of Outsiders in the English title. Yeah, Band of Outsiders. Okay, it was basically... I was like a one-man version of that. <laughs> I was running probably even faster. I love and it. it was the... wonderful. Interesting you say that because actually that's probably my favorite way of experiencing museums is uh, I seldom stop when I stop and I do stop it's like um, for a specific reason but most of the time I love to be in museums but I love to just constantly move around them. <laughs> yes because and here's the thing every single it's like it's like that Ray Bradbury show night gallery every single painting is a world or, you know, artwork or what have you. Mm. And if you stop and if you spend too much time at it, it can consume you. You got to move on. You got to keep moving. Yeah. And that's what I feel about it. Be it the Met or some funky gallery, you got to keep moving because, you know, if you get too seduced by a world, it can be 
hazardous but maybe even beautiful what about yeah. in general i mean sometimes the environments where we find ourselves just don't suit our lifestyle though you know but uh you seem to i have... live in las vegas you think in las vegas <laughs> yeah that's right i was gonna say you know you tried uh living in different places for a while right correct well i mean here's the thing i'm not crazy about the city but if i live in my own mind and I surround myself with good people it really doesn't make a damn bit of difference. <laughs> and that's so it's hard to contradict myself. But um, yeah, that I'm not I'm not nuts about the city, but every city has something to give you. I found people here who can inform that part of me. There's um, I have a friend, actually, she wrote a book um, called American Gypsy. And she um, she lived in a Romani family um, for quite some time. And she's a local author. She lives out here and she just toured through Prague talking about her experience living basically in a gypsy van. Mm. And so like they're out there. It's just, you know, there's not a neon sign for them. Wow. <laughs> I, I find these people. I don't know. I, they just, they seek me out. <laughs> she was actually at a play I was at. So there you go. But surely though, I mean, you said living in your own mind, that's easy. That sounds easy to do, but then life comes, comes, you know, has this amazing ability to hit you when you least expect it, to knock you when you're down. And, you know, you oh, may, totally. the, in the moments when you feel like, yes, I'm absolutely confident in what I'm doing and whatever, something completely unexpected happens and you realize that you maybe weren't as, as much in your own head as you thought, right? Correct. Oh, no, no. Life has a tendency to smack that smile right off your face and challenge you to a fencing match. Like, trust me, I know. But um, at the same time, with each strike you only get stronger or you're taken down by it that choice is yours yeah. but um that's right i say to myself well this can i mean i've written pieces about those moments and you know alchemy you can turn them into something quite nice if you have it within you i mean yeah sometimes things can suck i'm aware of this you're aware of this i'm sure people who are listening are aware of this but um it doesn't uh it doesn't have to be everything, if that makes sense. Well, the thing that I'm becoming increasingly aware of is that uh, when it comes to the arts in particular, people are very afraid to reveal themselves. And I'm not saying reveal aspects of the personality that they want, that they think they don't want people to know, but they secretly do. And uh, we could talk forever about this. But very, very, like very normal things. Like, for example, a lot of people don't know that uh, many of the artists that we know and love didn't just do the thing that they were best known for and sometimes didn't really get paid for it that well. You know, they had to do things on the side. You know, they had to do, you know, for, for actors, it's like commercials or yeah. for, um, you know, for just in general, you know, sometimes it was just like they, they shot films but on, on the weekends, but they also had a full-time job in a factory or something like that. It's oh, funny. absolutely. I have a, yeah, I have a friend who I'm very close with. Actually, I've known him almost as long as I've known you. And um, we met in Seattle and his name is um, he was actually had a little bit part on the Twin Pinks that they revived. And um, he he works his tail off, you know, as a yoga instructor. And then he was a waiter and stuff. And he made peanuts on that show. But at the same time, people are like, oh, it's so cool to see you. And it's like if only you knew like there are people in LA who will I mean let's just say Los Angeles will never not have waiters <laughs> you know? nice. it's, um, and it, it's sad but at the same time you know if you keep that muse going you just have to keep it fed yeah you know I do yeah what's the hardest part yeah. of just having that need to uh, to express yourself artistically mm, how so you know, just uh, maybe you're giving up on things to, you're, 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 that, that you might want to do or you feel like time goes by in a different way and sometimes you feel cut off from the rest of the world. Oh, yeah. Um, I completely agree with what you're saying and understand what you're saying. Um, I just think – I find sometimes it's not really lack of um, – it's not really it's not really so much just feeling isolated because truthfully having my own time is something i hold very dear i don't uh, um I, I i don't mind it at all but i think it's uh it, sometimes it's not so much as lack of fixation but it's lack of obsession i need something to obsess over passionately 
that's why I need to travel every once in a while. I need to re up. I mean, I, I don't need to go to, you know, the shores of Sicily. I can be in like a, you know, a shitty motel in Arizona and feel it. It doesn't matter. I just need to, I need to be in a place where I'm not in my element and that's when it thrives. And if I don't get that, I become agitated very, very quickly, yeah. you know, or I form a routine and routines age you. You know, and I, I would love to be in a shitty bar in Arizona. I have to tell you the truth. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> You're always welcome. It's only one state away. We can totally do it. <laughs> yeah, but not even in Las Vegas, like the really young glamorous side of Arizona, you know? <laughs> oh, oh no, trust me. I, I know Las Vegas isn't uh, in Arizona. We, but... <laughs> I'll take you to the shooting range. <laughs> uh, the even Nevada, Nevada I'm, sure, I'm sure that Nevada as well has places besides Las Vegas that aren't as glamorous as people think. Let me tell you something, actually. No, I mean, far be it for me to defend this town in any way because right. it doesn't need me to. But um, I will tell you, I mean, yeah, I'd rather... Seattle wasn't all that great. New York is nice, but I, I, there are places out here that are not... I sound like I have Stockholm Syndrome. It's not that bad. But no, um, there are some places out here that are quite great, like probably about 45 minutes away. There's a pagan temple devoted to an Egyptian goddess. I've been there. There's a opera house that was constructed by a ballet dancer from New York that's filled with 16th century paintings. I've checked that place out. I wrote about it in Trifecta. So the places are there. You just have to seek them out, but they're not on the thoroughfare. I love it. Was there any uh, was there any place in particular in your European travels that stand out to you that you remember but may not be, you know, touristy places, so to speak? Yes, definitely. Um, um, you know, we actually uh, – let me see. Well, there's there's the village that I went to in Germany. It's called Stiltek. It's next to Schwamburg. I hope I said that right. And um, beautiful little place, picturesque. It's in the center of the Black Forest, so, I mean – romanticism levels were at like 100 <laughs> and it was so great i was like hansel gretel where are you um other than that we have a mutual friend um fabio torre the artist um yeah i hung out with him and we went to um a trattoria and that was fantastic that's on the outskirts of bologna that's a city we both deeply admire and um it's great because there's long you know roadways and ancient ruins everywhere and um you know, it's nowhere near Rome, nowhere near any kind of craziness or crazy energy. I really enjoy abandoned little far off places. Those are those are where I I find my best work. You know, I mean, in Europe, it would be just a little village where I can just hunker down in America. It would be like a shitty motel in Arizona. Like, right. you know, it just it doesn't matter. I've I, you know, let me see. I stayed in a horrible little motel in um, Hollywood because I desperately wanted to go and um, I wanted to go to uh, see the grave of the silent film actor Ramon Navarro for some reason I want to check that out and you know we stayed in this motel that was so bad Matt there was graffiti in the bathroom like yeah. it was so awful yeah and I proper was like graffiti, <laughs> proper graffiti it was it was elegant graffiti they did a great job he colored in the lines it was wonderful oh. but no it was um it was it was fantastic because i was like this is freaking life man this is experiencing it's not always beautiful but it leads to beauty it's the journey that matters ah oh, man that's a very uh Pasolini way of looking at things man i've seen his plate by the way did you ever see the plate in bologna um it's in that school no um, i didn't go to the devoted. school no i haven't gone to the school no 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 uh, oh really you should check it out yeah if you're back there again you travel more than i wish i traveled as much as you <laughs> but, well that's then you should you know if you want to just don't have a don't have a house and uh <laughs> give up on that <laughs> well that nomad life man you know you know what it is <laughs> what it is chris about me is that actually i really really would love to have a place that i can go back to more possibly than i try than than i you know than traveling but yeah. uh, I don't know. I feel like uh, that's it's kind of a Kierkegaardian thing of me to think because I also believe that, you know, if I had it, then I would probably want to go back traveling. That's the thing. The second you got that, um, I don't want to say, uh, well, the second you got grounded like that and, you know, you signed a lease and you had keys and you had paperwork and all that stuff. Um, 
I think you would just kind of feel the prison stripes being slapped on you. Yeah. You know, it's, um, and that's the thing. That's what I think I've always admired about your, your work is the fact that you, you just keep moving. You know, you, you very much have that vagabond spirit, whether you recognize it or not. And I admire that because that's a rare bird these days. I think maybe I'm running away from something. <laughs> but you're running to beauty in the process. So, I mean, that's... there's really kind of a win there. That's a good way of putting it. Or you know what else I'm running towards? What? Death. Or you're running up that hill. And I'm running up that hill, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Keep which reference. But yeah, I don't think you're... Well, we're all running away from death, bud. It's all good. Running towards away, whatever. Just keep running. Yeah. It's good for the legs. <laughs> I think, you know, I think it's good to know that it does exist. You know, it can be a repressed thought in a lot of people's minds. But, uh, uh, you know, if you know that it's going to happen, you're not running away from it. You're running towards it, you know? Towards it. It's inevitable. Well, I mean, that's... That's one thing that a lot of the artists we admire, I mean, that's, we're all going to do it. You know, one day we'll all be stories. You'll be a story. I'll be a story. I mean, we'll all be, you know, and I don't fear it. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm fascinated by the way artists have interpreted the concept of death throughout the centuries. I love things like looking at old pictures of the Don's Macabre or, you know, the images that William Blake did about, you know, last judge, I don't think. I don't even think death is that severe, <laughs> but um, I really don't. We're just we're just shedding the skin. That's all we're doing. Mm. And um, I I find I find we uh, I, I I don't know. I'm just saying that I think the art about it is is wonderful. And if death, the artist interpretation of death, will never die because it's a fascinating topic. We don't know for sure what happens and we will continue to create because that's how we are going to interpret and ultimately try to chase whatever it is. So in a weird way, death is chasing us and we're chasing it. So we're bound to meet eventually. Hmm. On that note, Chris, I think that's a good, that's a good place to, to end our conversation. <laughs> oh no, it's over already. It's over already. <laughs> well, you know, we can do this again uh, some somewhere down the line, you know? Well, how about we, yeah, how about I finally get my ass out there and we'll meet in Brock. That how would be great. That? Then I can film, well, the then I can actually, me. Then, we, then I can actually document you and film you in person. Your sound is going crazy for some reason there. Oh, uh, is it better now? Uh, it's a Let little better, but anyways, better in time for, say, for saying goodbye. Uh, yeah, so if you do I come down, so. I'm, I I, I want to book you for a uh, for a little uh, shoot film shooting. You're comfortable in front of the camera, anyways, aren't you? Uh, I I am a Leo. All right. <laughs> yeah, dude, I have no problem with that at all, and I would like to do the same for you. I think it would be fun, and we're we're due for a face to face. It's only been what five years. Yeah, <laughs> it's probably been longer than that, Chris. Actually. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Oh, thank thanks very much for doing this. I really appreciate it. No problem. And you have a great day. And thank you for the opportunity. All the best on this uh, creative project, man. Good for you. All right.